Hi, welcome back to session six of Pirates, Smugglers, and the Making of the Modern World. In the first half, we were looking at China itself as a state entity, some of the problems that it had encountered, particularly the weakening of the administrative system, the problems with population explosion, and we saw some of the effects of those in terms of both creating a human resource for pirates, in terms of the boat people, and also the increasing ineffectiveness of the state itself in being able to suppress piracy and smuggling. And part of that, of course, stemming from the very large penetration of even the bureaucracy and the well-to-do classes uh, in terms of smuggling, with these broad-based bans that the Ming often imposed, and sometimes the Qin as well, uh, millions of people whose livelihoods were tied to international trade found their livelihoods at risk and became part of the smuggling and piratical activities. Then we saw, of course, the movement of what were relatively small-scale uh, pirate activities, although the pirates were large in number, uh, the movement of these people into Vietnam as a result of the Taesong Rebellion in the 18th century and how, as a part of that experience, this group, grew from sort of individual captains with their crews, the kind of thing we saw most commonly in the Spanish Main, into more complex organizations, into fleets uh, with captains and commanders uh, with specific relationships, patron-client relationships, owing their positions to the commander of the fleet, a sharing up of resources uh, from pirate activities, naval experience in terms of naval engagements in defense of the Taesong dynasty. All of these things making the pirates far more complex and, of course, from the Chinese government's viewpoint, a more dangerous organization. Now, session, the first half of the session ended with this collapse of the Taesong dynasty in 1802, leaving the pirates without a base of operations. And we were left with the question, well, where's a pirate to go? Well, kind of like Dorothy, you know, in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. So the pirates clicked their heels and headed for home. In fact, a mass migration of pirates and pirate leaders occurred after 1802 back into the regions in South China where smuggling and piracy had long flourished. Now they came back, however, as more than just individual pirate entrepreneurs, shall we say, but as organized fleets, as I said, each of them marked by a distinctive colored flag, the red fleet, uh, which was the most powerful, as we will see, the black flag fleet, etc. There were actually seven of these groups, the seven major ones, each with an individual leader. And after their return to China, after 1802, the seven leading pirate commanders met and agreed to form a confederation, something simply unheard of before in pirate activity, certainly not something we'd imagine occurring uh, in a place like the Spanish Main among people like Blackbeard and others. But here, these seven leading uh, pirate commanders, the commanders of these fleets, were going to organize an ongoing confederation. In fact, they actually drew up a document of confederation. And this is, you know, equivalent to a, a corporate document, uh, creating this corporate body, if you will, and establishing rules and regulations and how it would operate. For example, uh, they would agree to divide up their turf in terms of what areas, what riverways, what parts of the South China Sea each of them would tend to operate in. So there were divisions of turf where you operate. There were also rules like you don't steal from other pirate captains. In other words, not uncommon practice would be one pirate ship has success in seizing, let's say, a European merchant vessel with silver on it, and then another pirate comes along and steals that from the first pirate. Well, now that was prohibited. No more of that. You can't steal from each other, only from the outsiders. So you get specific rules of conduct. There was also uh, an agreement on honoring protection agreements that the pirates came up with. What this meant was the following, that always with pirate activity, even in a very fertile, target-rich area like the South China Sea, 
capturing treasure vessels, vessels with silver or spices or whatever, something that's really valuable, was not an everyday occurrence. You could not rely simply on seizures of vessels uh, to really build the bulk of your income. You needed other steady sources of income. One of those, one of the principal ones here, and to some degree with pirates elsewhere, were protection rackets. In other words, you paid insurance against piracy. And you paid the insurance premium to the pirates. That you paid them not to attack you. Simple as that, just as with Al Capone back in Chicago. You know, people would pay protection so that his thugs wouldn't come in and break up their establishment. So, too, merchants in the South China Sea area would pay protection to the Chinese pirates not to attack their vessels. However, these kinds of protection agreements wouldn't function. So you protection, these kinds of agreements and contracts didn't work very well. So another regulation in the Confederation was that you could not violate the protection agreements that other pirates had made with merchants. So this is a highly organized business enterprise, if you will. Uh, it's like a confederation of corporations that is now opening, operating. A criminal operation, nonetheless, but still highly organized and coordinated. Now, in addition, there were clear lines of authority within each of the fleets and in the whole confederation in terms of the skippers of each ship and then the headman. The headman was essentially the first mate uh, and clear lines of command down through the ship itself and in addition up through the fleet itself with a principal leader at the top. The leader of the Red Fleet, as we will see, is the overall commander of the confederation. And Ultimately, again, as was the case with their operations in Vietnam, there is to be a sharing up of goods throughout the Confederation now, not just within an individual fleet. And the commander, the overall head of the Confederation, is in charge of seeing to the maintenance of the operation. In other words, seeing that things move smoothly, that the regulations are enforced, that he reconciles conflicts and disputes over, well, is this my territory or is it your territory? And, of course, he is also responsible for making appointments within the command structure of the various fleets. So this is a highly organized operation. Now, it's not you know, a modern corporation. There's still a lot of wheeling and dealing and personal relationships more than there is, you know, objective decision-making. But nevertheless, there is this systematized process for cooperation and for coordination within the Confederation, something startling to think of when you consider the kind of freewheeling activities of the freebooters that we looked at last week. Now, the person who is in charge, who is the commander of the Red Flag Fleet and the commander of the Confederation, is Cheng Ai. He is the overall commander, the leader among leaders. He is the one who is responsible for holding this Confederation together and enforcing its rules. He came from a long line of pirates. So I say here, a family business in 1641. Uh, at that time, Cheng Ai's ancestor had moved from the land out into the sea, as many boat people had done. But unlike many others, he didn't wait around and try to make a living as a fisherman. He immediately went into piracy as his main occupation. So here is a man with over 150 years of family experience in the business. Uh, just like some people who sell furniture, etc. Here you could rely on a family reputation uh, serving the South China Sea since 1641. Uh, this, in part, was one of the reasons that gave him the status that he had in terms of heading the Confederation, that he did have this highly extended family with literally more than a century and a half of experience as pirates. 
He had served in Vietnam. Uh, he had been part of the Red Flag Fleet there and risen to its command. So he had considerable experience, again, as a naval commander uh, in terms of naval combat, etc. He was a highly experienced sailor. Now, he took as his bride uh, a woman named Cheng Ai Sao. Uh, she was a prostitute that he had met, and his blushing bride, of course. Uh, and she would become... Uh, the most important figure in the Confederation in the end. As much as Cheng Ai was important uh, in heading the Red Fleet and being the first commander of the Confederation, nevertheless, it is his wife, Cheng Ai Sao, who ultimately will play the greatest role. And even early on, even while Cheng Ai himself is in command, Cheng Ai Sao plays a major role. She is a consummate politician. She handles many of the issues of dispute. In, that occur within the Confederation. She is excellent at making appointments, at moving people around, knowing who to trust, you know, who can be relied upon, who needs to be moved out of a command situation, how to negotiate solutions to problems. Uh, she's the power behind the throne. Uh, Cheng Ai, without question, is a great naval commander, but she is the astute politician. She is the one that really makes the Confederation work. Because as much as it may be a Confederation on paper and have its rules and regulations, ultimately there's nothing to force the seven fleet commanders to remain part of the Confederation, as we will see later on. There's nothing that says you have to remain part of the Confederation. So to keep people in the Confederation, you have to have somebody that can make the rules and regulations work. I mean, after all, what are you going to do if somebody decides to leave or break the rules? Take them to court? and this is a criminal enterprise. Yeah, it's like the mafia. The mafia has the same kind of problem. You know, somebody violates the rules, you can't take them to court. You know, we're taking it to small claims court tomorrow because you, know, you didn't return the, the money we were due on that numbers racket. You know, with these people, it's the same thing. If somebody is violating the rules of the Confederation or wants to leave the Confederation, you have to find a way to solve that problem. And of course, if you engage in significant violence, the, each of these groups is well armed in itself one of the first things they'll do is simply leave the Confederation. So you have to find other solutions, other ways to accommodate people and keep them working together. And she is the genius behind the throne in that regard. Now, a third important figure in this triumvirate that dominates the Confederation uh, through virtually its entire existence is Cheng Pao. Cheng Pao uh, was a young boy. He was about between 13 and 15 years old. Uh, working on his family's fishing boat uh, that was attacked by one of the vessels uh, belonging to Cheng Ai, was seized, and he was taken captive. This was fairly common in terms of recruitment, shall we say, of pirates. Uh, a large number of the people who became pirates at this point were people who were on vessels that were attacked by the pirates and were taken by them, and either voluntarily are under some duress, uh, finally agreed to become pirates. Um, it was sort of 50-50. Some people would voluntarily do it for the good reason that we talked about earlier. For most of the boat people, life is pretty miserable. The possibility of becoming a pirate may not sound so bad because at least there's a chance that you'll make some money as opposed to the desperate economic circumstances you'll remain in as a fisherman. Others, however, often feared the retribution of the state because if they did get captured, penalty was death for being a pirate, so many refused. Um, when one such individual resisted Cheng Ai, uh, he had his arms tied behind him, and then Cheng Ai had him hoisted onto the mast of his ship and left him dangling there for about four hours. It's a rather painful position to be in. Uh, and when he got down, by God, he was committed to being a pirate. But this was a fairly form, common form of recruitment. You got captured on a vessel, and either through persuasion or a little bit of punishment, uh, you agreed to become a member of the pirate crew. In this case, uh, Cheng Pao agreed uh, to become a member of the pirate crew, and he quickly became a favorite of Cheng Ai. In fact, uh, Cheng Ai took him as a lover. Uh, they had a sexual relationship. This was also apparently fairly common practice among Chinese pirates. Uh, taking on young male recruits and establishing a sexual relationship with them. 
in part because apparently uh, homosexual relationships among pirate crews were fairly common anyways, but it may also have been a form of recruitment. In other words, how do you bind somebody to you, uh, ensure their loyalty? Well, if they're your lover, you know, you can be fairly certain of their loyalty. A uh, similar kind of thing occurred, of course, in ancient Sparta, uh, where among the Spartan military, uh, it was very common to have male lovers, and it had a very positive effect because, of course, you were much more likely to go out and fight ferociously since your comrade was also your lover. Uh, you were almost certainly going to defend him and fight to protect him and yourself. Well, a similar kind of logic operated among the Chinese pirate community uh, when Cheng Ai took Cheng Pao as a lover and then finally uh, adopted him as his son. Kind of complex relationship, and trust me, it gets more complex in a couple of minutes. Uh, but in any case, this was not uncommon uh, as a way of binding people uh, in terms of loyalty, maintaining their loyalty to the commander of the ship. And uh, Cheng Ai was engaging in a practice that, again, was very common among the pirates of the South China Sea at this time. Now, Cheng Ai, but particularly Cheng, Shao, Cheng Sao, are particularly busy with dynastic politics. Besides adopting this young man uh, as their son, they're also busy placing relatives, siblings and others, extended family, on the ships of the various fleets. This is one of the ways they held things together. Uh, and that is, well, look at uh, my brother or my second cousin, there's an opening position, the head man or the second in command on one of the, uh, the flagship of the Black Fleet. That position is open. I'll see that my second cousin gets that job. I'll make sure that the commander appoints him so that you're tying the network of the fleets together, not only through this formal agreement, but also through familial relationships, just as European kings and queens tied themselves together. We saw what happened in Spain with the Habsburgs and so forth, uh, the tying together of dynasties through marriage. Well, it was a similar situation to create ties of loyalty to do that in part, not only through the distribution of the wealth acquired by the individual fleets, but also by establishing the appointment of relatives in key positions in the other fleets so that they have ties of family that help hold the whole confederation together. So the dynastic politics of the Chinese pirates is very much like that of European monarchs uh, in the same time period and in an earlier age. Now, Cheng Ai will not live long uh, as the commander of the fleet. He passes away in November of 1807 and leaving essentially a confederation without a leader. There is no formal method for replacing the commander. Yeah, this confederation actually doesn't technically have a commander. It's a confederation, but the fact is Cheng Ai was the one who established himself as the dominant figure. Now he's gone. There's no rule for, you know, well, the board of directors will now meet and vote on, you know, the new chairman of the board or the new CEO. <laughs> there is no such provision. So the question is, will the confederation survive and who's going to lead it? Well, it's Cheng Ai Sao who becomes the new leader of the confederation. Again, here coming out into the open now, uh, what had been more surreptitious before were her skills as a politician. How to get along with people. She had made so many connections with the various commanders of the fleets. She had helped put her relatives and the relatives of Cheng Ai in key positions that she was able to win over a majority of the commanders to recognize her and the red flag fleet as the leaders of the Confederation. So this is a major accomplishment on her part. Now, at the same time, the fact is she's got an advantage in the fact that the Red Flag Fleet is the largest and most powerful of the seven fleets. Okay? Here I point out it's got 40,000 men and 200 junks. We'll see what a junk looks like in a minute. Uh, This is by far and away the largest of the fleets and the most powerful, so that gives her an edge. And on top of that, she's got another advantage, that Cheng Pao, the adopted son, now becomes the commander of the Red Fleet. So she, her adopted son, 
is now the commander of the most powerful fleet. That further consolidates her position as the commander or the leader of this confederation. And just to make things extra secure, she married him. So, yeah, <laughs> if you want to keep this straight. Uh, Cheng Pao was the young man uh, who Cheng Ai had sexual relationships with, and then he and Cheng Sao adopted him. Now that Cheng Ai is dead, Cheng Sao is essentially marrying her adopted son and her dead husband's lover. Must have been an interesting family relationship. Call in Dr. Phil. Uh, but apparently this all worked pretty well because the relationship between the two of them proved to be highly effective. I mean, uh, this worked very well. And Cheng Pao turned out to be an excellent sea commander in his own right. In fact, was considered uh, even more of a naval uh, genius than his father had been, or his adopted father had been. Uh, he becomes recognized as the most skillful of the pirate commanders within the Confederation. So they really make, you know, a power couple, to say the least, no matter how strange their <laughs> coming together may have been. Now, Cheng Pao himself is an interesting figure in a variety of ways. Uh, he, on the one hand, had strong religious beliefs. And in fact, on his flagship, he had built a temple uh, as a part of religious ritual and made religious practice, worship of ancestors and so forth and various local gods, a key part of his practice as commander of the Red Fleet. So here is a man of considerable complexity. I mean, he recognizes the importance of the idea of ancestor worship, which has been largely lost by the boat people who comprise most of the crews, and he recognizes the importance of pulling people together in an ideological sense, and he uses these religious practices as one means of doing that. In other words, you need something to inspire people above and beyond just, well, we're going to go out and make some money today, guys. You know, how do you, you know, instill esprit de corps? Well, one of the ways you can do it is through religious practice. And another element of this is that uh, there's a very strong element in Chinese culture in regards to pragmatic approaches to religion, that one of the purposes of religion is to go to the gods and request favors. You know, I need something. You know, I'm making this sacrifice. I'm burning incense or sacrificing, you know, or bringing a bowl of rice or whatever I can afford and offering it up to this god or that god for success. Uh, and there is a strong belief in these practices and that they do play an important role in success. So Cheng Pao has provided that kind of outlet for his crews as well, that they can believe, look, we're making these offerings and this will ensure us success in our pirate ventures. So he's a fairly complex individual. He was also highly charismatic. Uh, and here I tell the story of uh, the Seaman Lu. Seaman Lu was uh, an individual who, again, was captured by pirates uh, and became a crewman on the flagship that was commanded by Cheng Pao. However, Lu's father had been murdered by pirates. And he believed that Cheng Pao uh, was responsible for that, that it had been pirates from the Red Flag fleet who had killed his father. And he planned to assassinate Cheng Pao. Sounds like the script from, you know, Gangs of New York. Uh, and in fact, he confronts Cheng Pao, uh, and Cheng Pao does not pull a weapon. Uh, he simply stands before the young seaman and says, you know, that I would never do that kind of thing, that I would not engage in that kind of cowardly activity, but I can understand your desire to seek revenge for you know, your father's murder, and I respect you for that, and I'm going to turn my back and walk away now, and you're still part of my crew. Uh, I'm, you know, not going to do anything to you. And Seaman Lu drops his weapon, and that's the end of it. Uh, and here is a man who faced down this crewman who was threatening his life and who he could have had killed by members of his crew, but instead he shows his personal courage by not pulling a weapon himself and also his magnanimity by forgiving him. 
And as we will see, forgiveness was not high on the list of virtues of Chinese pirates any more than it was high on the list of Western pirates. You usually didn't forgive and forget. Turning the other cheek was not normal. <laughs> usually the idea was you cut the person's head off and then you didn't, they didn't have to turn the other cheek. Uh, so this was highly unusual and demonstrates that this really was a charismatic figure. And we can understand some of the success here in part because of Cheng Sao, but also of Cheng Pao's charismatic personality. The two of them together make a very powerful combination in holding this confederation together and making it so successful. Now, by 1809, the confederation as a whole consists of about 1,800 junks, 1,800 ships, and 70,000 men. Obviously, approximate, but probably pretty close because, as we will see, the Chinese government had reason to try to keep an accurate count of how many there were. So this is an enormous, enormous force. And you think about, you know, what are the Western navies like at this time? You know, you're talking about maybe 100 ships, 150 ships, maybe 100 men on a ship, a couple of thousand men. And you think of pirate activities in the Spanish main, you know, a century earlier, you're talking about two, three, five, maybe six ships in most cases, a dozen at most, and again, a couple of hundred men. Here you have tens of thousands of them and nearly 2,000 vessels. When I say men, however, uh, it's a misnomer because many members of the crew were women. Uh, unlike the Western tradition, where women were largely excluded from participation, that they might be on board a pirate ship, but only because they're the wife or the girlfriend of the captain or they're hostages that have been taken. Unlike that experience, in China, women often constituted a significant portion of the crew. Exactly how many, we don't know, but uh, it would be easy to say at least 25-30% of the crews, uh, or in other words, um, perhaps as much as a third of those 70,000 crewmen or women were women. So they play a major role. Why is that the case? Largely it's the case because women from the beginning with the boat people played a major role. They were used to manning the boats with their husbands. These fishing boats were family enterprises and everyone worked together, whether it was rowing, steering, pulling in fishing nets, uh, and in the larger boats that tradition continued. So women generally were well experienced, at least among the boat people, they were people who were well experienced in sailing in the basic sea crafts that were needed. So it was only logical that they in turn would become part of the pirate crews since they had the same kind of skills that the men had and that were needed to man and steer these pirate ships. So that kind of tradition stemming from the boat people and the large numbers of women that were involved directly in the fishing activities led them of course to have a major role on the boats as well. And there were no issues of Jonas or bad luck and this sort of thing that was, you know, simply not an issue uh, when it came to gender relations on pirate ships in China. Now, that's not to say that the presence of women on the pirate ships in China brought out the softer side in piracy. Uh, far from it. Uh, just as the pirates were seen in the Spanish main, tended to be a rather rough, even vicious group at times, so too Chinese pirates were known for similar kinds of activities. Uh, one of their punishments, and this is one I must say was usually inflicted not on uh, captured merchantmen, you know, the crews of captured merchant vessels, it was usually inflicted uh, on captured naval crews. In other words, when ships of the Imperial Navy came looking for the pirates and lost the battle and the crews were captured. And this was the kind of thing that they were likely to do to the naval crews because they were seen as out and out enemies and of course they were going to execute or would capture the pirates and lead to their execution. Uh, one of their techniques in dealing with the crews was to take a crewman, uh, and most people on the ships were barefoot anyways, uh, and they would nail your feet to the deck and then they would beat you with sticks. Uh, for as long as you could stand up, which was a pretty long time since your feet were nailed to the deck. Uh, and then finally, after you might have endured this punishment for three or four hours, which would of course be excruciating, not only because you get you know, nails in your feet, but because people are beating you, um, 
after about three or four hours of this, uh, they would finally relent and cut your head off and relieve your agony. Uh, but this was not an uncommon punishment for crewmen of Imperial naval vessels that were captured. You can understand why, as we'll see in a minute, that naval crews were often hesitant to go chasing uh, the pirates, <laughs> knowing what would happen to them if they lost. And of course, again, you're dealing with this huge set of fleets. I mean, you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of ships. It's not like you're chasing one little pirate ship. It's not like going after Blackbeard and finding this one vessel uh, that you can defeat. Another common practice uh, in terms of treating or well, mistreating the enemy uh, was simply disemboweling people, uh, slashing open their abdomen and pulling all their internal organs out. Um, uh, we'll see what they did with those in a minute too. But in any case, this was another way of punishing people that you know you didn't like, uh, and particularly people on naval crews. Uh, generally, lesser punishments were assigned to people uh, on merchant vessels, and punishment usually had to do with uh, the fact that if a merchant vessel were captured and uh, the crew refuses to tell where the most valuable part of the cargo is hidden or where money might be stashed or they refuse to join the pirates, then they would be subject to some kind of mistreatment. But the more extreme versions were usually uh, the end result of naval battles. Uh, now, to get themselves up for these kinds of activities and particularly to prepare themselves for battle uh, when they were going to either attack or be attacked by the Imperial Navy, uh, the Chinese pirates, including the women, had uh, a sort of ritual they went through, which was they had wine that they would then mix into gunpowder. So they would have a mix of gunpowder and wine, which they drank. Uh, this tended, for one thing, to give them blazing crimson complexions. <laughs> Yeah, the, the gunpowder essentially went off in your head uh, with the alcohol, and it made you a little crazy. I mean, uh, it was sort of be like the equivalent of taking speed today, you know, and as you're getting ready to go into a gang fight or something. So when Chinese pirates went to battle, you know, they weren't just, you know, your, your logical, rational, well, let's go get them guys, you know, this isn't getting up for a football game. These people are half crazed by the time uh, they go out to launch an attack on a merchant vessel or a naval vessel. They're pumped, shall we say. A uh, very explosive combination of wine and gunpowder. And that would explain in part also some of the violence that's often inflicted because, you know, when people are crazed as a result of, I've never tried the combination of gunpowder and alcohol, but I, uh, from eyewitness accounts, apparently it really does make people uh, a little hyper, you know, it's like hey, taking too many steroids before the big football game. Um, sort of drove them out of their minds, made them extremely aggressive. So some of the violence would stem from that kind of activity. And it was their way of dealing with the fact that this combat was extremely violent. Most of it, as we will see, was hand-to-hand -hand combat with knives, etc. So you had to get yourself up psychologically for this kind of thing. It wasn't a matter of shooting somebody who's 200 yards away. Uh, this is a matter of facing a person, you know, two feet from you, and you start slashing at each other with sharp knives and <coughs> stabbing each other with poles and pikes, etc. So this was a way of getting themselves up psychologically for that kind of activity. Uh, one other way they had of doing that, uh, I mentioned disemboweling. Uh, it was not an uncommon practice, although not you know, an everyday kind of thing. It wasn't on every week's menu. Uh, but they would periodically, when disemboweling uh, an enemy, cut out the person's heart and then carve it up and eat it raw um, with the belief that this sort of gave them an extra power that imbued them with some of the spirit of their enemy. Kind of practices that are uh, seen elsewhere in the world periodically. But again, it gives you an idea that you know, this was no pleasure cruise uh, that these people were on. They were operating in a highly violent environment, and they themselves had to sort of get themselves up to engage in these extremes of violence and to face the fact uh, that they were as likely to die as were their enemy in any given battle. So activities like you know, drinking gunpowder and wine and eating people's hearts were ways of creating a psychological environment where they would be capable of this violence and capable of it on a regular basis. Now, when the pirates start out, they had, as I suggested earlier, pretty minimal technology. 
uh, in the early days, before the experiences in Vietnam, most pirates operated out of sampans, very small fishing boats uh, that operated right along the coast, and their weapons were pretty crude. They might have a knife that would normally be used for scaling fish, or a hook that was meant for pulling in uh, fishing nets, and those are the weapons, or just a club, you know, just hit somebody over the head with it. Uh, so technology, the technology of violence uh, was pretty minimal in the early days uh, of the 17th century, before this experience in Vietnam when they became better armed. As we get to the latter part of the 18th century, and especially by the time we talk about their return to China uh, after 1802, uh, they are far better armed and their equipment is far superior and larger to what they had in the past. And here are a couple of pictures that will give you an idea of what vessels, pirate vessels, would look like in China. Now, the same as in the West. Pirates didn't go out and commission a special ship, you know. They, they weren't in a position to go to a shipbuilder and say, yeah, I'd like to build myself a you know, first-class pirate vessel. What they did was they captured vessels, usually merchant vessels, and then equipped them to serve as pirate vessels. Uh, here's a trawler, which would be a shore trawler that you would see along the coast of China uh, in the late 18th and throughout the 19th century. Uh, an open deck kind of operation might be used for carrying cargo along the coast, uh, not a very large vessel, and this would be sort of an intermediate step, uh, a step up from the sampan uh, into a slightly larger uh, type of vessel. Uh, but this was by no means the most important or most significant of the vessels that the pirates used. Instead, these two vessels, which are Chinese junks, uh, yeah, can we see them both? Yeah, well, sort of. Uh, both sailing vessels with multiple decks, you know, uh, poop deck, uh, captain's quarters, and portholes on the side where cannon would be installed uh, depending upon uh, how well armed the ships happened to be. These vessels uh, were really the equivalent of most of the significant war vessels that the Europeans had at this time. Now, the Europeans would have somewhat larger war vessels. You know, war frigates would be bigger than the junks. But most European vessels, merchant vessels, and a lot of the naval vessels that Europeans had at this time were about the same size and of approximately the same quality. So in that regard, there's really not a significant technological advantage uh, for Westerners. And I mention the Westerners because we're going to see them become involved in the war with the pirates. Uh, but they're pretty much on an equal par at this stage in terms of these vessels. Now, much of the warfare was carried out still by boarding vessels. The attempt would be made, of course, to disable your opponent, your enemy, your target, and then get your crew to go on board. One of the ways they had for disabling, particularly in the earlier days, uh, was by throwing um, what would be essentially jars of burning oil or tar onto the opponent's vessel. Uh, you'd put it at the end of a bamboo uh, pole and simply fling it onto the other vessel with the idea that the flames would spread out and start the other ship burning. Sometimes they would take small boats, pile them with straw, set them on fire, and set them sailing at the opponent. What the pirates did and what other vessels did, uh, in part to try to stop at least the fireballs, was to hang netting along the sides of the vessel. So when you see one of these things actually sailing in the 19th century, it wouldn't look this clean and neat because all along the side would be like uh, fish nets and they'd have all kinds of junk, essentially, uh, intertwined in the netting. The idea would be that you'd raise the level of the ship so that the pots would have to be thrown much higher to get over that. Most of them hopefully would hit on the side of the netting and bounce off and they wouldn't burn your vessel down on you. But that was one of the basic tactics for attack at this time by the Chinese pirates. Now, a step forward that had been accomplished certainly by the time that they have returned to China from Vietnam is the increasing use of cannon. These cannon, however, were not uniform. Oftentimes, what they managed to get were 
cannon that might have been manufactured in China, might have been produced in Europe, you know, stolen off a Portuguese vessel, captured off a Spanish vessel, or whatever. So you get a real mishmash. Furthermore, the quality of Chinese cannon at this time was far inferior to that of what was being produced in Europe. Uh, in fact, because of the unevenness of the quality of metallurgy at this time, uh, the Chinese cannon had an unfortunate tendency to explode periodically. You know, when instead of the ball being shot out, the barrel just exploded. So the pirates had a preference for European goods. But they also needed help because they did not have a lot of experience with the more advanced naval cannon that were being produced. These were very different from the land-based cannon that the Chinese had tended to specialize in, just as the Ottomans tended to specialize in cannon that were meant for land battles. Uh, those to be used on ships were very different, and the whole process of making them, and even more importantly, firing them. You know, how do you fire these things accurately? You know, you've got a ship that's bouncing on the ocean. Uh, you've got maybe half a dozen cannon on one side of your ship. How do you aim these things? You know, you, you don't have, you know, a range finder. You don't have radar, et cetera, to aim the thing. It really took experience uh, to train people on how to fire these things accurately. As a result, the pirates, when they did capture Europeans on merchant vessels, which they often did, uh, often retained those people who had some experience in naval combat, who had served in one of the European navies, in order to use them uh, for training purposes so they could learn to use the cannon more effectively. But it's still their, um, their ability to arm themselves and fight effectively with cannon was always a bit suspect just because of the technological disadvantages, they suffered from the fact that China had not advanced significantly in these fields, you know, the technology of warfare in recent centuries. So they were trying to play catch up themselves by using European equipment, but also they needed the training by Europeans. In fact, much of what we know about the Chinese uh, pirates comes from some of these Europeans who were held hostage for perhaps several years on board the Chinese pirate vessel uh, while they trained the crews and helped train the pirates in how to forge metal and make more effective cannon. Now, besides improving their technologies as the Confederation continued to develop, they also tried to stabilize their finances. And in part, this was done in the same way that pirates have done it elsewhere, and that's by ransoming people. It's very common for them to go on shore and kidnap people or to kidnap people they found out on a sailing vessel and hold them for ransom. Uh, this provided one form of additional revenue uh, to supplement the often uneven returns from capturing merchant vessels. And we also talked earlier about protection. The key protection racket for the South China pirates was the salt trade. Salt is of fundamental importance to every society at this time, and of course China, with an exploding population, particularly has desperate need of salt. It is perhaps the most important marketed good next to rice and grain, because your food isn't going to be preserved unless you have salt to preserve it. So the salt trade is extremely valuable, and salt junks were constantly moving down the waterways along the South China coast, moving salt into the major urban centers for sale. It was officially a government monopoly. Well, this meant that you had a ready target. The salt merchants had a constant guaranteed trade. Now, there wasn't going to be a lot of fluctuation in their trade because it's not like we're dealing with silks or satins, you know, that this year the market for silks or satins is down, et cetera. This is salt. Everybody has to have it. So the merchants had a steady flow of income. And that's what the pirates tapped into by selling them protection. Either you agree to pay us X amount every month, or we'll attack your salt junks, we'll steal them, and sell the salt ourselves. So a major protection racket developed, and large numbers of salt merchants wound up paying protection on a regular basis to keep the pirates off their backs. Now, in addition to that, uh, the salt merchants also traded with the pirates. The pirates, of course, had all kinds of interesting products that they had stolen from one ship or another, and the salt merchants had, of course, 
salt. And once they had sold their salt, they had cash that they could use. So a steady trade existed between the salt merchants and the pirates uh, during the early 19th century. I mean, there was a lot of business to be done be between the two sides. And this extended out to the larger community. Uh, the pirates needed regular uh, revittling of their ships. In other words, they had to land periodically and get food. You know, they're not going to go fishing, uh, you know, spend their time fishing. They have a specialized trade, piracy. And besides which, you can't just live on fish, not if you really want to be healthy. So they would regularly have to land and load up. And that meant they were buying all kinds of products from local merchants, peasants, etc. So the communities, again, along the coast, have a close economic tie to these people. This is where they buy their supplies. And furthermore, this is where they fence most of their goods. You know, they go on shore and get together with merchants or fences, depending on what you want to call them, since they're dealing in stolen goods, and they would sell the goods. So there is a fairly strong base of support within the South China community for the pirates. That's not to say that everyone loved the pirates. Obviously, merchants who found themselves victims of pirate attacks, if you found your you know, daughter being kidnapped, you know, your son dragged off by pirates to serve in a pirate vessel, you weren't too happy with them. But on the other hand, there were a lot of people who had significant economic ties to the pirates and had every reason to want to see them continue with their success. Another area they became involved in at this time was the opium trade, the smuggling of opium into China. Uh, the opium trade is prohibited, but the fact is by the early 19th century, and indeed for some centuries before that, China had been developing a serious opium problem. And the percentage of the population that was addicted to opium uh, was variously speculated on 15, 20 percent of the population. Uh, some of the figures, if true, would be astronomical because we get worried if 1 percent of the population is drug addicted in a modern society. It was a major problem and was going to become a more explosive problem when Europeans became heavily involved in the trade and tried to force the trade on China uh, in just a couple of decades. But in the meantime, the pirates did take a slice of this uh, product as well and became smugglers in this case, smuggling uh, the opium in. And of course, they had these large armed vessels. Obviously, they had an enormous advantage in terms of carrying the trade in and being fairly certain they weren't going to be molested by local officials who would hardly dare attack most of these powerful pirate vessels. Now, what is the government to do about all this? <laughs> and it's hard to ignore the fact that you've got 70,000 pirates and a fleet of nearly 2,000 pirate ships operating off the south coast of China. The Qin Dynasty is going to have to come up with some kind of answer. Remember, Canton is the key port now. This is where all the international trade is coming in. And here are the pirates sitting right on those trade routes and preying on those vessels, as well as preying on the coastal trade along the coast. So they have to do something about it. The answer in 1805, uh, when things were just getting bad, not their worst yet, but really getting bad, uh, was to send Governor General Na to launch an anti-pirate campaign to wipe out the pirates. Now, he is an energetic official, despite what had happened to earlier officials in earlier centuries who had tried to wipe out smugglers, winding up in jail. Nevertheless, General Na is going to launch a vigorous campaign to try to get rid of the South China pirates. But he is going to face a formidable task, in part, of course, because of the sheer power of the pirates themselves and their confederation. But there's more to it than that. He also has great internal problems. Obviously, the Chinese state is not the most effective. It's been deteriorating. It's become less effective. It's had difficulty dealing with the population explosion. The scholar gentry, or the mandarins, whom we talked about earlier, have become less efficient, more corrupted, and government in general does not work very well. Furthermore, the military is deeply divided. You do not have a single national military as you would conceive of in a modern state. Instead, you have layers of different military organizations. At the top is what's called the Manchu Banner Army. This is the official army of the Manchu dynasty. Remember, the Manchus are invaders. They're outsiders. 
who have established this dynasty in China. This is the force that the Manchus want to depend upon because they don't necessarily trust the local Chinese armed forces. They remember what happened to the Mongols. <laughs> they eventually got overthrown. The Manchus are going to keep their own banner army. That's the top flight army. It's the one that the dynasty relies upon. Now, below them are the Green Standard Army. This was the old Chinese army, the army that had been there at the time of the Manchu invasion. So it's Chinese army. It's at a second level. And below them are a variety of provincial forces, militias of various kinds that have been created. There is little or no coordination between these three groups, first of all. It's not like this is a, a system, as in the United States, where we have a regular army and a reserve, and they're, of course, closely coordinated. The three of them operate virtually independent of each other. And, of course, the Manchu dynasty does not really trust the other military organizations other than the Banner Army. So here you've immediately got a problem, uh, a lack of coordination between the various levels of armed force that the state has at its command. The Navy is grossly inadequate. Given the problems that the state has had in terms of overpopulation, trying to feed people, inefficiency and corruption in the government, uh, a lack of financial resources has led to neglect of the Navy. Much of the time, of course, the Ming and the Manchus were excluding international trade, and they had certainly stopped any type of long-distance international voyages uh, like Zheng He had undertaken. So the Navy has been allowed to go into serious decline. Many of its ships are unsailable. They simply are not in condition to go out into sea. Their crews are abominably treated um, in terms of pay, which they often don't get, in terms of being fed, in terms of physical punishment. If it was bad in the British Navy, it was even much worse in the Chinese Navy. The um, degree of esprit de corps is somewhere around zero. In other words, you know, these guys are not out there to fight and give their lives for the Manchu Emperor. In fact, between the ferocity of the pirates and the inadequacy of their own vessels, many of the captains of the Imperial Navy in the South China Sea, after General Na was appointed and began this anti-pirate campaign, would scuttle their own ships so they wouldn't have to go to sea. You know, they'd write to the provincial commander or they'd write to General Dahmer and say, you know what happened? My ship sank at the dock today, so it's going to take me two months <laughs> to raise it. By then, of course, we're all hoping the campaign will be over and none of us will get killed. So you literally have a Navy that's dying not to go to sea and doing everything they can not to go to sea. And there are huge gaps uh, in the naval forces even when they do go to sea in terms of the number of vessels, in terms of the adequacy of their equipment. In fact, what General Na has to do is begin hiring fishing junks uh, to serve as naval vessels. Uh, he will rent the fishing junks from their owners, then they'll be equipped with as much naval armament as he can put together and be sent out to sea to fight the pirates. Even here he's got problems because uh, the emperor is constantly turning down his requests for funding so he can properly arm these vessels and build new ones. So he's being asked to fight this war on a shoestring. Hardly a ticket for success. Another step that he takes to try to combat uh, the pirates is to set up self-defense forces on land. Uh, the idea here is that you could starve the pirates out. If they can't gain access to food, if they are attacked or repelled every time they try to land uh, on shore and replenish their supplies, then sooner or later you know, they'll run out of food, they'll either have to leave or surrender. He sets up what's called the Pao Chi system, which was a system of local village defense. The problem with the Pao Chi system is that it does not include the local leadership the local leadership being the local large landowners, the gentry. The gentry had traditionally taken on this role of organizing militias and leading them. General Na chooses not to include them 
in this because he realizes that the Manchu emperors are concerned about that kind of activity. They would see that as subversive. The emperor's fear would be, oh, the Chinese gentry is organizing militias. Yeah, they say they're going after the pirates. Next thing you know, they'll be turning those militias on us, and there'll be a rebellion. And this is what had happened uh, before uh, to the Mongols, is that the local gentry had organized rebellions. And of course, the Manchus don't want to give an excuse to the gentry to organize military forces. So they are left out, and that makes it difficult to get this self-defense system working effectively. Meanwhile, the Europeans are getting a little bit upset about the Chinese pirates, as you can imagine. They are the ones who are sailing these merchant vessels into Canton, hoping to make a fortune, and instead they're finding themselves robbed at gunpoint uh, by the pirates who steal the silver that they have brought to purchase Chinese goods. So the British are pressing the Manchu emperor to allow them to pursue and destroy the pirates. Now, with great reluctance, the emperor allows the British to make a go of it, to attack the pirates and try to suppress them. He was very leery of doing this because, of course, he would be giving authority to a foreign power to operate in Chinese waters, and, of course, that held foreboding prospects for the future in terms of his authority and his power. Was he going to become nothing more than a puppet of foreign forces? And that was already a very great concern within China, given China's increasing weakness in comparison to the growing uh, military might of Western powers that were now visiting China and trading there. Now, the British go after the pirates, but they're not very successful. Now, they have some encounters with the uh, pirate fleets, uh, but it's not, you know, Britannia rules the waves. They're not going to sweep uh, the Chinese pirates away. These people are powerful. You know, their vessels may not be as big as the biggest British frigate, but on the other hand, they're more maneuverable. They are also heavily armed, and they outnumber you. If nothing else, you know, when you send out one or two British frigates, they can send out 10, 12, 15 junks to surround you. So, <laughs> yeah, you may get one or two of us. What about the rest of us? So this British venture into pirate suppression at this point is not successful. General Na is now under intense pressure. Uh, in the effort to suppress the pirates, his effort in this regard, has not worked. And, of course, the emperor is demanding results. You know, he wants an end to piracy. He doesn't want to put up with any more of this pressure from the British and others. And something has to be done to suppress the pirates. So what General Na decides on is an age-old solution. Amnesty and pardons. Pardons and pacification. In other words, okay, stop being pirates and we'll forget you ever were a pirate, there'll be no punishment. And the you know, punishment, at least officially, is death, so that's pretty big forgiveness. More than that, he's also offering bounties to people to surrender. You know, if you agree to give up and to accept an amnesty, we'll actually pay you to stop being a pirate. This has some success, although it's hard to measure exactly because General Na was anxious to make it appear that it was highly successful. But some people were coming in. Uh, the complaint was from other uh, imperial officials was that, yeah, the pirates would come in and say, all right, give me my 50 bucks or whatever you're going to give me to stop being a pirate. And then two weeks later, they're back out being pirates again. You know, all they did was come in and collect a wage you know, for temporarily accepting an amnesty or a pardon. So their argument, or the argument of the critics, was you know, we're just recycling pirates through a pardon system that doesn't really prevent them from resuming their criminal activities. And General Na is dismissed uh, in the belief that his effort was a failure. And it was, ultimately, but hardly his fault. Uh, between the multiple layers of the military, which did not coordinate among themselves, the unwillingness to put gentry in to create militias, uh, the atrocious state of the Chinese Navy, and the sheer power and force of the Chinese pirates at this point, he really didn't have much of a chance. At this point, the war is really being carried on by local navies. The provincial governments put together, they will hire, for example, some of the salt junks uh, that are used to transport salt and some of the fishing junks, just as Na had done, and send them out to attack the pirate forces. 
However, they are not very successful. In fact, Cheng Pao is able to sail up the Pearl River all the way to Canton. Uh, let's go back to our map for a second. Yeah, this will show you. Pretty much what the pirates had done was to operate along the coast here, okay, all the way from the uh, border with Vietnam along the coast here and somewhat east of Canton. But up until now, they had not sailed up the Pearl River and actually threatened Canton itself. Uh, largely, there wasn't a need to uh, in the sense that uh, they could get most of the vessels that they wanted, they could attack them uh, simply by waiting out at sea to find them sailing into Canton or out of Canton. And uh, they didn't want to also take on the shore batteries in Canton, so there was little need to attack it directly. And that's not really what Cheng Pao has in mind now either. He, the reason he's doing this is because he's responding to these attacks on the pirates and saying, hey, look it, you want to you know, stir our hornet's nest? Fine. We can make things a lot more difficult for you. We can actually threaten the port of Canton itself, one of the most important ports, maybe the most important port in all of China today. We can put it at risk if you don't leave us alone. So it was really meant as a threat to the emperor to let him know that they needed to back off. In response, uh, the emperor authorizes the formation of the militias with the gentry now. Um, the earlier attempts at self-defense forces had not been successful, so he's going to have to take it a step further and actually allow the gentry to form these militias. However, that effort does not prove to be successful. The pirates continue to score victories. Uh, they frequently land on shore uh, to encounter a village where they've built breastworks and uh, barriers and uh, the militia is out and they run right over them uh, because they're better armed. And of course, <laughs> they're all stoned on gunpowder and wine anyways. Uh, so why do you care about a few muskets being fired at you? So these efforts at self-defense are not highly successful. They certainly are not starving the pirates out. They're not really denying them access to food because if they have to, the pirates can usually overwhelm the self-defense forces, the militias that are there to face them. Uh, the British step in. And the Portuguese eventually also will be given permission to launch an expedition to attack the pirates. So now we have two European powers uh, aiming at the pirates and seeking to suppress them and confident that they are superior technology. And it was true, certainly, that the cannon, for example, uh, that the Portuguese and the British had were more up-to-date, their crews were better trained, etc. And they do inflict some damage on the pirate confederation ships. What they fail to do is to defeat the Confederation. There's a major battle in the Pearl River estuary, and the end result is indecisive, which really translates into a victory for the pirates because they don't have to go away, and they are not being driven away. They are not being starved out. They are not being denied access to the targets of opportunity that exist. So the Europeans, of course, will report that they sank X number of pirate ships, you know, 20, 30 pirate ships, which sounds pretty impressive until you figure, yeah, but there are 1,800 of these things, you know, you sink 20 or 30, uh, within six months, they'll be replaced. So they inflict some damage, but it's more like a, a bee sting uh, than any kind of death blow to the pirates. But what is going to happen now is just the opposite of what you would expect. Here, the Chinese government has failed to defeat the pirates. The Europeans have inflicted some damage, but really haven't been able to defeat them. And yet, at the height of their success, the pirates are going to disband their confederation. This begins with the surrender of Kao Po Tai, who was the commander of the Black Flag Fleet. He is really the second most powerful commander in the Confederation because the Black Flag Fleet was the second most powerful fleet. So this is a major figure. And yet, he is going to surrender. In 1809, he will be the first of the pirate commanders to lay down his arms and to surrender his vessels. 
However, this is not exactly a surrender. What he's doing is accepting a pardon, an amnesty, with the understanding that he can retain a significant portion of his fleet along with all of the wealth he has acquired as a pirate and he will be given a position as a naval officer commanding his own little fleet. So what he's basically done is taken a portion of his fleet, the better ships, and incorporated them into the Imperial Navy hmm. with the understanding, and this is a written agreement, uh, not trusting the Chinese emperor, by the way, he has the Portuguese consul in Canton uh, negotiate the agreement and witness it. Uh, and what he will now do is he will become a pirate hunter. So he will now have a job with the Imperial Navy to hunt down pirates. In other words, hunt down some of the people he used to work with on a daily basis. Now, Cheng Yi Sao and Cheng Pao will also finally surrender after prolonged negotiations. There were a series of meetings, and it looked for a while as though they might not agree to an amnesty or a pardon, but finally they do in 1810. So here we have the two most pow powerful pirate commanders and the couple that really dominated the Confederation who are now accepting an amnesty and stepping away from piracy. Now again, it's not exactly hat in hand surrender. Once again, Cheng Pao is going to be allowed to keep the best ships in his fleet and he too is going to get a position in the government. He is going to have officer rank in the Navy and he will use his fleet of ships, although a reduced one, to chase pirates. So the commanders of the black and red flag fleets are now going to become pirate chasers hmm? at the pay of the government. And they were allowed to keep all of the wealth that they accumulated while they were pirates. And indeed, over the next several years, uh, they are able to capture and destroy a number of vessels from the former confederation and many other commanders of vessels and fleets surrender under similar kinds of terms. So that by about 1815 uh, the threat of widespread piracy in the South China Sea that had been there ever since the pirates had moved back from Vietnam in 1802 largely disappears in part because of outright suppression by a navy now bolstered by former pirates and in part because a generous amnesty program offered them the opportunity to keep what ill-gotten gains they had obtained and often gave them positions in the government. So they cut a very good deal for themselves. Uh, they managed to keep the wealth that they had acquired and gain official recognition. Uh, there was a great deal of anger within the government over these policies because they say, well, these people are scum, you know, they're boat people and they were pirates, and now you're giving them titles within the government. But of course, <laughs> there really wasn't any other solution since they had been unable to defeat them on numerous occasions, trying to suppress them through naval action. Now, why did this happen? Why did the Confederation break up at this time, just when they were enjoying their greatest success? In some ways, we're looking at the negative side of success, you know, what things were contributing to the falling apart of the Confederation, even as it was enjoying such success. Part of the answer is simply this, that as the Confederation grew into such an enormous size, it strained the patron-client relationships that had made it work in recent years. You remember how Cheng Yi Sao had made sure to place her relatives and Cheng Ai's relatives and friends in various positions and various uh, ships of the different fleets. But as the system grew, it really became impossible to continue extending, you know, how many members of your extended family do you have that you can put into the various crews? So more and more, uh, the crews of the ships and commanders were made up of people who had been added to the Confederation but had no particular tie of loyalty, famil familial uh, relationship uh, with other members of the Confederation. Furthermore, the Confederation was never designed to prevent people from leaving. 
and there really was no basis on which they could uh, prevent people from leaving. So between the limits of these patron-client relations, in other words, you can only take sort of a family-operated enterprise, if you want to call it that, and make it so big. You know, it's not a modern corporation. It doesn't operate in the same way. It has limits to how far it can grow. And the fact that the Confederation was never meant to be a system that you could not leave. Those two factors, combined with some smart choices by the pirate leaders, that this was the time to get out. Okay? Obviously, the Chinese government was not going to be able to stop attacking them, and the Europeans were going to become more and more involved. They had made a great deal of money, and they had a golden opportunity to step away, take their ill-gotten gains, achieve political power in positions in the Navy and elsewhere, and come away with social status that they never could have had before. All of those factors combined led to the dissolution of the Confederation on a rapid basis. And indeed, Cheng Pao is very successful as a military officer, first as a naval officer, then he takes command of military forces on the ground, uh, is involved in arresting uh, a gang of uh, opium smugglers, of all things, <laughs> something he was quite familiar with, uh, and had a very successful career within the military uh, until his death in 1822. By then, he and uh, Cheng Yisao had produced a son, and Cheng Yisao tried to raise the son as a worthy successor to his father, teaching him how to ride a horse, teaching him military skills, uh, but the kid just didn't work out, you know, maybe too hard to living up to dad's reputation. He got involved in gambling and opium smoking and was not very successful. Cheng Yisao, however, was an inveterate entrepreneur, and she opened a gambling house and remained highly successful as a businesswoman in the years after her husband's death until her own passing in 1844, the passing of what was truly uh, the dragon lady of the South China Seas. And with her death comes to an end uh, this tale of this phenomenal pirate confederation that was forged out of the boat people of the South China Sea in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Now, how do we summarize all of this stuff? You know, how is it similar or different to experiences we've seen with other pirates? First of all, the causes of Chinese piracy. One is a long tradition of smuggling and massive smuggling because of the periodic bans and often universal bans on international trade. Sometimes the bans were selective, you know, focused on Korea or Taiwan, but other times uh, all trade, all international trade uh, was banned, such as when uh, the Ming Dynasty first comes to power and they want to focus on agriculture and defense, then no trade is allowed. So you have millions of people who have a motivation to try to smuggle. So that means that smuggling is going to be rampant on uh, the China coast throughout these centuries, and that, of course, creates all kinds of opportunities for pirates as well, in part because smugglers often had to arm themselves to protect their own activities, and because smugglers themselves were easy prey for pirates. Between the government trade bans and the interests of the well-to-do or the gentry, and the corruption of local officials, who also played a major role in this. Remember, local officials were actually active in writing permissions for sailings of ships that they knew to be illegal, actually setting up the schedules for smuggling ventures. These people were intimately involved in the whole process. They had shares in the smuggling ventures. And in general, you have a weakening of the Chinese state. Clearly, China is in decline. The restoration of the Ming Dynasty in the middle of the 1300s also means that China stops progressing in a variety of areas in terms of its political development, its bureaucracy, <coughs> which becomes increasingly compromised and less efficient. Its military, especially its navy, as we have seen, uh, increasingly unable to cope with the most basic of its responsibilities and certainly unable to suppress the pirates once they form this confederation. All of these factors combine uh, to create an environment uh, that is rife for piracy and smuggling. Along with that, 
is a ready supply of potential pirates, the inhabitants of the water world of the South China Sea. The boat people, the tanka, the egg families, if you will. People who were, on the one hand, skilled in living on the water, but also economically desperate and socially disaffected, alienated from their own society. The experience of working with the Taesong in Vietnam makes these pirates into a well-organized, well-functioning, informal navy with command structures, with naval skills, and with a fair amount of technology. Then there are the patron-client relationships, the idea of bringing people in who owe you a debt, putting family members in to these fleets to give family connection. The Confederation itself, which provided a structure for sharing of wealth and for command. And then there is the talent of people like Chen Yi Sao, the woman who became the Dragon Lady of the South China Sea, whose political skills really made the Confederation function effectively. Combine all these factors with the ones that we just looked at in terms of the weaknesses of the Chinese state and a divided and adequate military and a certainly undermanned, under-equipped navy. Put all the factors together and you have one of the most dramatic and explosive epics of piracy in modern history in the late 18th and early 19th centuries along the South China Sea. Next week we're going to turn to a very different kind of topic, although we've touched upon it, that's the social history of bandits. We're going to look at things like torture, uh, gay pirates, the role of women, the role of blacks in piracy, and a variety of other issues to understand the culture and society of pirates. Till next week.